I'm the senior scientist of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And I did used to be director of space. But then that title got a little complicated because at NASA headquarters, they set up a division called the universe and they had a director of the universe. <laughs> you think I'm making this up? <laughs> this is what the bureaucracy is like. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to follow Clark Chapman's excellent lecture. And fortunately, when we discussed this, we weren't sure what the division of effort would be between us and we have somewhat different topics, but I'm also pleased to say we have different perspectives. And it's not that we don't agree on fundamentals. We've been working together on this since the late 1980s. But I want to, to take a different position, which I'll state right up front uh, before we get into the body of the talk. Clark talked about probabilities and emphasized how low the probabilities of an asteroid impact are. And of course, the bigger the impact, the lower the chances. And this is absolutely correct, and as a scientist, figuring out probabilities from the population, the dynamics, is a great thing to do. And it's a good thing to do also to scope the problem. But I take a perspective now. We aren't interested in probabilities. If we were, we wouldn't even be in this business. Why would any astronomer go spend his life looking for objects that, that we're so unlikely to hit. Uh, it's often when, we, when the news report first comes out of an asteroid in which uh, you know, it looks like it might hit, like the story of Apophis uh, two years ago, there are those who get up and say, and they're absolutely right. You can say, I am sure that when more data come in, it will turn out not to hit. And they're almost always going to be right. But the real business here, for those of us who are interested in protecting the Earth from asteroids, is the one that will hit. It may be very rare, but it is a singular, deterministic event. And so I'm going to focus on that question, not what are the probabilities. What is the next asteroid that has our name on it? Can we find it? What are acceptable approaches to protecting ourselves? If you just said, what are we going to do on average in the next century to defend, us, defend ourselves from asteroids? It's, of course, nothing, because they aren't going to hit on the average. But what if one of them does? What if the million-year event actually takes place tomorrow? At some level, it could, although we've pretty much reduced the probability to zero. But that's, that's the kind of issue that I'm going to talk about uh, as, as opposed to one that's based on probabilities. Um, let me start with a question that, that Penny already talked about quite a bit. And that is uh, the issue of mass extinctions. And I'll be talking about that quite a lot. And the fact is that this approach is contrasted to normal environmentalism. Now, I'm not an environmentalist by profession, and I'm sure there are much more sophisticated perspectives. But the usual idea is conservation. We want to maintain species. We want to maintain ecosystems. We want to reduce the footprint of humans. And yet, we would not be here if the world were constant and there were no change. Evolution has been driven by changes both gradual and catastrophic. And the specific example is, of course, the end Cretaceous impact. Uh, had that not happened, we would not be here. Or if we were here, and we might, uh, we would be sitting in different kinds of chairs and we would be different shapes because we would be intelligent dinosaurs. Uh, so one can ask philosophically, evolution would even proceed to any great extent on a planet that was not subject to catastrophes such as impacts of comets and asteroids. And when we talk about preserving our environment and therefore perhaps eliminating the issue of impacts, we are talking about playing with very fundamental evolutionary properties that have been part of the Earth since its beginning and that were quite specifically in some sense, for our being here. Because catastrophic environmental changes, such as mass extinctions, not only wipe out things, 
They provide an opportunity for speciation, for the development of new ecosystems, and that in itself may be a good thing. Now let's talk for a little bit about the end Cretaceous impact. And Clark has said quite a bit, so I'll, I'll go through this rather quickly. Just to remind you, there are really two events here uh, that we believe are the one and the same, but sometimes they're confused. The one is the extremely well-defined change in the marine life as produced in the microscopic marine life, protists, uh, foraminifera, that are readily observable in a, in a marine section of sediment and which come by the billions precisely where one area starts and another ends. You can see what this event was and that is precisely coincident with the impact at Chicxulub. And then there's the other question about the large creatures like dinosaurs for which this fossil record is much more sparse. And there are those who will still say, I hate to say it, that the impact at the end of the Cretaceous surely produced marine extinction because it's hardly deniable the impact horizon is right where the species changed, but it may not have killed the dinosaurs. And I think that is a rather contorted form of thinking. Uh, you know, it's like, like when we talk about San Francisco in 1906, and uh, indeed the city was destroyed by fire, but it's silly to ignore the fact that an earthquake took place a few minutes before the fire started. <laughs> so, as I say, the, the boundary is well defined in marine cross sections. It's harder to find in terrestrial ones, but it certainly has been done. And the Alvarez hypothesis from that team of lovely people you see at the lower right is one of those daring hypotheses that was profoundly important and has turned out to be largely correct that an impact, a single event uh, 65 million years ago that produced that boundary layer that is identified by iridium and other uh, uh, metals that are rare on the earth uh, really was the cause of the extinction. And Clark's mentioned this also, that from what we know of the frequency of asteroids and comets, we would expect an event like that roughly once every 100 million years and the fossil record shows us mass extinctions roughly once every hundred million years. And while there is no proof uh, in anything but the KT, uh, there's certainly a plausibility argument that external events may have been causing those other mass extinctions as well. What comes out of this, and I'll just even consider just the KT, is that Evolution runs on two completely different time scales. There is the evolution we're taught in grade school, if we go to the right kind of school, uh, which is a <laughs> gradual condition. Uh, it's, you know, who can run faster, who can reach the higher leaves, uh, who's smarter, um, who's more disease resistant, and there's competition between species and it all takes place in a very slowly varying background environment. And surely that is the main process of evolution. Then, every so often, you get a thunderbolt from the sky, you produce a massive catastrophe of global proportions, and you kill 90, 99, 99.9% of all the living things, which is what happened at the KT. And suddenly, survival depends very little on how fast you can run. Or, or how resistant you are to disease, and it has to do with other phenomena that we're not selected for, such as being small or living in the, in the mud. And this probably has happened many times through history. So I'm just arguing again, the mass extinction, the catastrophes, are a part of the natural world, and they've given us this, this scale in which much of evolution takes place slowly, and then every so often there's a catastrophe, maybe quite rare, and a massive new speciation afterwards, and it's selecting for quite different things. The Tunguska impact we've already talked about. It's the poster impact for us because it happened in historic times. And uh, it turned out to be in a rather wild wilderness, and it wasn't until 
nearly 20 years later that the first scientific expedition went there. But then if you think about it, uh, in the 20 years after 1908 in Russia, there were quite a few other things that were going on too that may have, have gotten in the way, like World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, but it was real and it happened. And uh, it provides us an example toward the small end of the range of dangerous impacts, just as the KT provides us an example at the large end. And these are just to show you what these objects look like. Clark's already given all this. Let me turn now to the issue not of what can or may have happened in the past, but what we can or should do now to protect the planet from an impact, assuming that's what we want to do, assuming we want to intervene in the evolutionary process. And in this respect, the U.S. Congress, the House of Representatives, has very much taken the lead, more than NASA, more than, the, uh, than, than any other agencies of the government. And this statement back in 1991 is really what got us started. I think it's pretty good. Rad Barley may have been partly responsible for it. Uh, but it's, uh, it talks about the possibility of an impact and says that the chances are extremely small, but because the consequences of such a collision are extremely large, it's only prudent to assess the nature of the threat and prepare to deal with it. And now, some 20 years later, having in fact carried out a very successful program called the Space Guard Survey that I'll come to in a minute, we have another congressional mandate, uh, which I think is equally interesting and, and technically even more challenging. And that was the statement uh, at the end of 2005 that the administrator shall plan to develop and implement a near-Earth object survey program to detect, track, catalog, and characterize the physical characteristics of NEOs equal to or greater than 140 meters, whereas the previous study uh, and the Space Guard program simply goes down to one kilometer in size. Uh, and we just got, a couple of weeks ago, the official NASA response to this request which I quote at the bottom, which is that due to current budget constraints, cannot initiate a new program at this time. So this is a case where the Congress asked, and NASA, because of budget considerations, feels it can't comply. Uh, it led, in fact, to one interesting press statement, uh, which I will paraphrase. I should be able to quote it, but it was basically the headline was that NASA knows how to protect us from almost all asteroids. Uh, but there's no money, so they won't do it. But that's what the world is. You can't do it without money. Um, Clark has talked about the hazard of globally catastrophic impacts. This is a concept that he and I came up with a long time ago, that there is some threshold, perhaps not well-defined, but some threshold at which the impacts effects are global. And it's primarily the Alvarez KT kind of scenario in which you produce dust in the stratosphere uh, to produce a, a uh, and crop failures around the world. Um, but it is still much smaller than the KT impact and hence takes place much more often. And this is a, a, a version of, of what Clark showed, the log log plot that we all love, uh, which simply gives you a span with energy, the unit on the bottom in megatons, the unit we use for nuclear explosions, and frequency on the left, uh, all the way from the KT impact up through Tunguska, Hiroshima-sized impacts, which take place for about once a year. And I should mention, uh, Clark and I know this well, we, we calculated this. Uh, it wasn't original, but we pulled it together about 1989 and said to ourselves, uh, oh shit, What's going wrong? Have we made a really stupid mistake? Because surely if there was a Hiroshima-sized impact in the atmosphere every year, we would have read about it. How can this be happening and nobody knows? And uh, in fact, it turned out not only is, does it happen, but there are people that know because the Defense Department of the U.S. and probably of the Soviet Union have surveillance satellites that are looking down at the whole Earth and see these bolides coming in and exploding at high altitude. They explode at such high altitude that they don't cause any damage on the surface, uh, but they're easily detected from space. And since this issue came up just at the end of the Cold War, we were able to go talk to the people who do the surveillance systems. They have told us that, oh yes, we know what those are, those are big meteors. 
And uh, we've, we've built our software to bias against them so that we won't confuse them with things that are interesting, like missile launches. And, uh, and you know, that it, it was well known to them, but not to the rest of us. Now, with the world somewhat different, uh, there's a press release once or twice every year from the Air Force that report on these large events in the upper atmosphere. So this anchors that curve rather well at the uh, upper left side. Um, the risk taken as a statistical risk is no larger than things like earthquakes and severe storms and volcanic eruptions and is much less likely to happen in many contexts than something like a storm. And, and we all understand that. Uh, the point is that, that the large end, uh, even a kilometer or two sized object, can produce a global destruction, can threaten civilization, could kill a billion people. And that makes it qualitatively different. Uh, but as I indicated, I'm going to take a little bit more of the other perspective, that rather than calculating averages and average fatalities and a number of equivalent deaths per year, it makes more sense to talk about it as a discrete deterministic thing where our challenge from a public policy point of view is to find these objects and predict the impacts long enough in advance to do something about it. Uh, and the example I often give is if you we're going to cross a busy highway like El Camino Real up here. Uh, first of all, you would not do it with your eyes closed. You would look. And secondly, you probably would have no interest whatever in the statistics of how often a pedestrian is run over crossing that road. You would simply look and see if there was something headed for you. And that's what we want to do with asteroids. Look. Open our eyes. If we look, we can have plenty of warning. If we don't, We'll have no warning. It's a bimodal distribution. The things, if we find something and survey it and find out it's going to hit, we will know it. And if we don't, the first warning is when the sky lights up and the ground shakes. There's nothing in between. There's no body of people out there uh, scanning the skies uh, for last minute approaches of asteroids. The Space Guard survey, which as I mentioned, is an ongoing activity is aimed at finding the asteroids bigger than one kilometer because those are, in fact, the most risky. They're not the most frequent, but they have the biggest risk that Margie back there, for instance, that it will say on her tombstone that she died from an asteroid. That is dominated by the ones larger than one kilometer, not the smaller, more frequent ones. This is a graph showing the progress. It's been very successful. Uh, in finding objects. It's up now uh, above 4,000. Um, you'll notice the larger than one kilometer ones, the red ones, are actually beginning to roll over uh, just as a completeness thing. We already have 75% of them, and so the rate at which we find them is less because we are rediscovering the ones we already know. And the next step, should we consider this? And this is now getting a little bit into the ethical issues. Should we consider that we have a responsibility to protect not only against those that threaten civilization, but to detect, uh, to detect and protect against the smaller ones? Then the first step, which is what the Congress has asked for, is to build bigger telescopes and find smaller objects. And just to put it in cost-effective terms, these objects represent a cumulative risk, these smaller ones, that's an order of magnitude lower than that from the big ones. And finding them costs an order of magnitude more. So in cost effectiveness, you drop down two orders of magnitude. And you are now dealing with the question that we were discussing at the end of last time. Is it worthwhile to spend this kind of effort and money to protect against something that is less dangerous than earthquakes or large hurricanes that happens rather infrequently. And that is the question that you have to answer when you go into this, whether it's a congressperson voting the money or a scientist deciding to develop, to devote his or her time to this project. Is it worthwhile? Is it worthwhile to put all this effort into finding something which only happens once every few seconds and has a rather local impact? 
Now, local still means, as in the case of Tunguska, able to wipe out a city like Washington, D.C. But that's not where it's likely to hit, right? It's most likely to hit in the wilderness or the, the ocean. So I think it's worthwhile to do this search because it's relatively economical. But there is a question, a threshold, at which you ask whether your money wouldn't be better spent on something else. One reason that we really are interested in finding these objects is that this is the only natural hazard that one can, at least in principle, stop from happening. We're sitting here a few miles from the San Andreas Fault. I don't know if you've felt it, but as you stand here, the plate is moving constantly. The stress is building up. It will give way at some point. There is absolutely no way I can imagine ever having a technology of earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes or big volcanic eruptions. But if we found an asteroid on an impact trajectory to Earth, we could stop it, at least in principle. The way you do it is you change the orbital period because you simply want the asteroid to get to the intersection point either earlier or later. Uh, if it would have hit the Earth without being deflected, you change its orbital period so it will come there a little early or a little late. Um, to talk about the ways we would do it, which have eth ethical implications too, um, these are not ordered in order of desirability, but let me mention them. There are really just three on the table right now. One is kinetic impact. You simply smash into it with a rocket at highest speed as possible. And of course, you have to, to do this along the direction of the orbit. You want to either speed it or slow it. There's no point in changing it out of the orbit because it's back. But if you speed it up or slow it down, it's a cumulative change in position. Uh, and so you can do it. It turns out that uh, given 20 years warning, and the kind of rockets that are being developed right now for the human return to the moon, uh, you could intercept objects and change their orbits, virtually any one, uh, up to about a kilometer in size. Might take two or three hits, but otherwise you could. And it's, of course, what you're after is momentum change. And first of all, you have the momentum change just from the momentum of the rocket that crashes into it, but in addition, it digs a crater ejects more material, you got a, a, a Newtonian action-reaction effect and increase the, uh, the momentum transfer. Um, probably the biggest uncertainty about it is that the actual kinetic energy of these impacts is substantially larger than the energy uh, of gravitation that's holding the thing together. So would you break it apart? You don't want to do that. And that may, might make you want to hit it several times with smaller hits than one big one. If you don't like that, you can do almost exactly the same thing with a nuclear bomb. Uh, and uh, a nuclear explosive packs a lot more energy, joules per kilogram, than anything else. The uncertainty is we really don't know how that comes to the asteroid. How do you translate that very large energy release into a momentum change? And the problem that is common to both of these kinetic impact and nuclear, is that there's a great uncertainty as to what the final orbit will be after you've done this. It's a sudden explosive thing you do, and then you wait, and you really don't know what's going to happen. Is that good enough? Maybe it eliminates the uh, impact this time, but the asteroid stays on an orbit where it'll come back and get us. Is that a problem? We don't know. This brings us to the third one, a very clever idea of a gravity tractor in which you simply put a spacecraft close, use the gravitational pull between the two, apply a very slight thrust to the spacecraft, and in effect just drag the asteroid along, linked only by the gravity between the two. Very weak, very slow, but it is controllable. If that's good enough, if that will supply the necessary momentum change, there's considerable virtue in that. Some people are very, very unhappy of the idea of a nuclear option here. Uh, and I have even talked to audiences who said they'd rather be hit by the asteroid than apply a nuclear explosion to defend themselves. Not quite sure why, but this is the way many people feel. Uh, seems to me that, that we have plenty of nuclear bombs on Earth and getting 
of them in space would be a perfectly okay thing to do, but not everyone agrees with that. Um, there are a lot of questions. Even if we carry out the search, should we also be developing the deflection technology? And that's going to be the sort of ethical issues that I conclude with. I won't go over Apophis here. We've done that before. I should mention that asteroids are reachable, it's been said before, by, uh, by human flights. And there's a study that's gone on recently uh, with scientists from JSC, JPL, and Ames looking at whether the architecture and hardware we're building for the return to the moon could also be used to visit a near-Earth asteroid. Some people said here that asteroids are easier to get to than the moon. That's true if you have plenty of time, if you're willing to go a whole orbit around the sun to get to it and come back. But if you talk to the astronauts and you look at the size of the crew vehicle, you find you want to devote uh, a year or two to this initial trip. So we're looking at the ability to carry out a 90-day or less round trip to an asteroid, in which you fly from Earth to the asteroid, rendezvous with it, it'll be a small one, uh, do what you're going to do for a few weeks perhaps, and then come back. The modern equivalent of Apollo 8. Uh, and this could be done probably after going to the moon, but perhaps even beforehand. Uh, so initial search to see, first of all, how do you get the crew vehicle to support astronauts for, uh, for 90 days? And the answer is you can only carry two, and you fill up the rest of the space with, with consumables. Uh, what about the orbits? Well, there are very, very few asteroids. They have to be asteroids in almost precisely Earth-like orbits. And guess what? The Earth eliminates preferentially asteroids that are in almost like orbits. Um, we found one that works, uh, 2000 SG344, but the opportunity happens to be in 2069. Um, so there are two perspectives on this. This is with our very limited knowledge of small asteroids. If we carry out this, this large-scale survey, we will find at least 20 times as many objects in this size range as we now know now. So if the idea is that, well, there's an opportunity once every 60 years, and you have 20 times more, then of course you have opportunities every two or three years. But I will tell you that when this was presented uh, at, at NASA, the other argument was made, said, let's see, the, right now you have no object you could get to, and you're going to find 20 times more, and isn't 20 times zero still zero? Which is true, too. Well, yeah, it may not be. And, uh, and this, this is possibly a, uh, a rocket upper stage. Uh, but there aren't going to be many objects as the Earth preferentially clears out this area. And, uh, and I think it's an interesting question. I would love to see astronauts go to an asteroid in the near term, but I don't think we've proved yet uh, that there's going to be objects out there with suitable orbits for them to get to and back in such a short trip. Um, now, let me just talk about several ethical issues quickly here uh, dealing with, uh, with mass extinctions and a defense of the planet. Um, first, of course, is the question of the value of spending money. I think almost everyone would agree that if we knew that an object was going to hit, we would be willing to spend a great deal of money to deflect it, even if it was the smallest Tunguska, let alone something that would be civilization-threatening. Uh, but in contrast, say, global warming is happening already. So should we take money, if it were ever that simple, from global warming and spend it on asteroids? This is an interesting question to me, for which there's no obvious correct answer. Clark mentioned also that in this case of a small asteroid, we might prefer not to spend a billion dollars to deflect it. We might be much better off simply to let it hit, even if that required uh, evacuating an area uh, where the target was. Uh, and this is quite true, but now imagine that the U.S. and NASA and the Department of Defense are making this decision, and the target is some other country. Uh, one might have a different attitude if you lived in that country uh, than we would if we were making the decisions. And it's especially tricky if you imagine this to be a country we're not on very good terms with at the moment. 
An interesting difference between this and other global challenges is in general, global challenges like global warming or overpopulation or terrorism or nuclear proliferation require the, an international agreements and action. They require most, if not all, the countries on Earth to agree to what the program should be. This is one that, in principle, any one spacefaring nation could protect the Earth from asteroids. Whether that's a good thing or not, one could argue, but it puts it in a different category. Um, there are lots of questions that arise from the point of view of a scientific community, and this has mostly been done by scientists so far. Um, how likely is it the public would accept a warning, especially if we keep having these so-called false alarms? in the newspapers. Um, would they trust the scientists who said it was going to happen? Would there not be some small vocal community that say, oh no, they're wrong, uh, they're just uh, risk mongers? And for comparison, I just read recently that in April a year ago, only one-fourth of the Republican members of Congress believed that humans were contributing to global warming. Uh, and that's in spite of a strong scientific consensus in that area. So decision makers might not and the public might not. Um, in fact, it leads, there's, there's also the problem of false alarms and false expectations that has led to a very interesting episode in The Simpsons. I don't watch The Simpsons, so I'm reporting from other people. But after an episode in which they discovered a comet was going to hit, and it came through the atmosphere, and it blew up in the atmosphere and did no damage on the ground, after all this trauma, the issue is how can we keep this from happening again? And the suggestion, I believe the bartender was, burn down the observatory. In other words, how do we deal with the, the perhaps very real cost? Uh, opportunities lost, uh, false alarms, contributing to economic woes, the, uh, the person in Costa Rica who, who can't build or can't sell their resort because of some, some remote rumor that an asteroid Apophis might hit there. Uh, are those not actual considerations that we should put in? Uh, to the equation. Let me conclude by uh, quoting Carl Sagan. Uh, he was concerned about a different problem, and it's fascinating to contrast to him and Edward Teller, who interacted in this as probably the two best known scientists in, in the United States, if not in the world. Uh, Edward Teller thought the best way to deal with asteroid impacts, he was very passionate about this, was to build bigger bombs. That a mere 100 megaton bomb might not be enough, so let's build a 1,000 megaton bomb. Um, Carl was much more concerned about unintended consequences of having an asteroid defense program. And in Pale Blue Dot and in his articles in, in Parade and in speeches he gave, his example of unintended consequences was the Marsh of Camarina. Camarina was a, uh, a Greek city-state in Sicily, 5th century BCE. They had a health problem, which their wise leaders realized might have something to do with the swamp that surrounded the city, so they drained the swamp to improve public health, at which point their neighbors, finding the swamp no longer there to protect them, attacked and killed all the men and carried the women off into captivity, and the city totally ceased to exist. Now, this is the kind of consequence that Sagan was worried about in what he called the deflection dilemma, that if we developed bigger bombs or air-based uh, defense systems, that the actual risk of misuse was greater than the problem we were defending against. That was always in the context of probabilities. As I say, the whole response changes when you actually have identified an object and know it's going to hit. That changes the perspective completely. So Sagan was concerned about that, and at the time he wrote, he basically said, we aren't mature to make this kind of decision. So let's defer it. Uh, right now, mad people could take in charge of countries. You know, there could be terrible accidents. Let's wait until we have a better understanding of the technology and of human society before we build a defense system uh, against asteroids. Um, and that comes back to my initial question, which Penny also talked about. Is it appropriate this natural process? 
even if we think we can control ourselves and keep a nuclear option from, from damaging society, is it still something that we should do? What is the relative importance of conservation, of preserving the status quo, uh, versus trying to deal with what could be a catastrophic change? And I will say right now, where I come down on that, I think we do have a proper obligation as humans who have the intelligence and the ability to protect ourselves from the next impact with evolutionary significance. The next one that could draw, destroy civilizations or produce mass extinctions. I'm not sure, on the other hand, that there is any similar imperative to spend a lot of money to deal with smaller impacts. And I think they're two very different questions. Let me conclude by, by quoting Carl in the end of his essay on the, the Marsh of Camarina. He said, since hazards from asteroids and comets must apply to inhabited planets all over the galaxy, if there are such, intelligent beings everywhere will have to unify their home worlds politically, leave their planets, and move small nearby worlds around. Their eventual choice is our, as ours is spaceflight or extinction. Thank you. stimulating presentation, uh, I'm going to ask you to put yourself, you, you were going to make a comment about uh, Schwartz's uh, position, I think, earlier. Could you, I know he's not here and hasn't presented his position, yeah. but given what has been said, where would you fall out? Well, there were two issues. Debate? There was the, the, the sort of mechanical issue of what you can and can't predict and that you do have this line of impacts, which he's emphasized a lot, and you, because you know the orientation of the orbit, which is what produces this line of impacts, many orders of magnitude better than the actual position of the asteroid along the orbit, you'll always have that kind of uncertainty. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to say what I said at the end, that I don't know the answer. It is not obvious to me that we should spend a lot of money and energy to protect against impacts on the scale of Tunguska. I think that's a legitimate scientific question. I think to protect against big ones is a no-brainer. The money is extremely well spent. But at some point, I have to ask how much effort we should put into, detect into small ones. And I say Tunguskas, but there's no lower limit in terms of public interest. If we found an object that was only 20 or 30 meters across, and said it was headed for you know, San Francisco. I don't think if the scientists said, oh, but that's so small it will burn up in the atmosphere, that they would be believed. So we could have a lot of these smaller ones, and it's a question of how, how it is in our scale of priorities uh, to deal with them. I don't know the answer. Rest, Rusty feels he does. Yeah, the subtlety here, I keep, uh, sorry to keep on talking about Rusty, but the subtlety here was that as you acquire more data on a potential impactor, um, you begin to shrink the uncertainty about where the impactor is going to hit. Uh, but for, for example, say a 20 or 30 meter impactor, um, you still don't know exactly what the impact mitigation efforts might be. For example, with a tug or a, um, what did you call it, a, uh, the, the gravity tractor, right? Uh, so as you, as you begin your, as you proceed with your mitigation efforts, you're shifting the risk around the globe. That's and there, right. And therefore, how do you make a decision? At the, you, you have this problem where the cutoff is, not only where the cutoff is, but um, how it affects the probabilities as you proceed. That's right. I, I said that the virtue in those three deflection approaches of the gravity tractor is it's controlled. That is, it's not, you don't just hit it suddenly and move its orbit. Controlled means that you gradually drag the impact point from where it naturally would have been on Earth off and in the process cross all the other countries in between. And that raises a whole specter of other issues. Right. What if the tractor breaks? Right. 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 I mean, if you want to be really crass, you could even put it in terms of liability. You know, e even if you, if you 
there would be months in which the impact point would have moved, say, from France to Italy. And the Italians, you know, the tourist trade would collapse, all these things would happen. Would the U.S., who was undertaking this shift, be responsible? Oh, um, speaking of Rusty, no. <laughs> um, but actually, um, well, I, I, think, um, I, I was interested in, in, in a couple points in your talk in, in your use of the word we. Um, and thinking of, uh, not to be too Clintonian about this, um, but uh, questions like, you know, should we spend the money? I think if you really think about, uh, do you mean we as American citizens, we as the global population of Earth? I think some of the ethical issues actually comes down to, you know, who, who we're talking about when we ask these questions. And actually, one of the points that Rusty did make last night, and I think his main punchline, although this hasn't been mentioned yet, was that um, given the nature of this problem and the kind of subtleties that Mark just mentioned where um, there has to be some agreement that you're going to increase risk for somebody temporarily to decrease risk for everybody ultimately, that uh, it's, it's inherently a global problem uh, that requires global solutions. It won't really be fixed. We won't really have the capability to fix it until we evolve some kind of global um, decision-making mechanism. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you also talked about uh, the tricky question of you know, how much should we put resources, resources into this question versus, say, global warming. But in the sense that, that the real step we have to make to be equipped to deal with finding the big one of these is to evolve that global decision-making mechanism so we're not paralyzed by these questions. Well, no, I want to, we should push it that way. No, we should push it that way. Meanwhile, it's approaching us. Um, it, it, With three space-faring countries, each putting their machines yeah, up, exactly. pulling in They're different directions. Yeah, exactly. They're all tractors on opposite sides. So, so in that sense, we have to do the same thing to solve this problem that we have to do to solve global warming, which is figure out how to solve problems globally. It's, it's the same challenge, and, uh, you know, sociologically, politically, uh, maybe even ethically, and in that sense, maybe they're not in competition with one another. I greatly admire what I would call an idealistic perspective, that dealing with this problem may actually help us to develop global decision-making processes that will be good for other things as well. But the other part of me sits here saying, I've been working on this for 20 years, and the only nation that has taken any serious interest is my own, and I hate to wait for some sort of global consensus. It seems to be very hard to get. Paul? Uh, you mentioned that uh, this is something that could potentially be done by even one nation. It occurs to me that even one nation could potentially use one of these as a weapon, find an asteroid that was headed close to the Earth and aim it at its em enemy. And that perhaps this consideration will compel us to make the catalog, make the catalog public so everyone know what's going on. Well, two comments. First, the catalogs are completely public. This is both our pride and our pain that any journalist at any time can go on the web any day and see what the orbit is for every single known asteroid and what the chances of Earth impact are. And it's absolutely open and hanging out there uh, for anybody. But, but in the case, you know, the, the issue that troubled Carl most in his deflection dilemma discussion uh, was not accidental misuse of, say, a nuclear defense system, but intentional. That, that some country led by some insane dictator would decide to use this as a weapon. I don't happen to think that's very likely, but, but it, it was his issue. John? The, the targeting a point on Earth is thousands of times more difficult than getting it to miss Earth. Right. And to try that on the first attempt, is beyond insane. There are yes. several governments on Earth, therefore, that are logical candidates to try it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, and, and it also is an argument, by the way, for using the crude techniques like kinetic impact, because you absolutely couldn't direct them. All you can do is just bat it out of the way. The sharp elbow effect. Yes. Yeah, I, I tipped you off earlier. 
let's suppose, let's suppose we buy progressively better NEO detection systems that give us completeness down to size of X meters, okay? Now, at, at each point, we have to decide how much would it cost us to improve the, the uh, detection ability to get the size down to, say, 100 meters, all right? What, uh, at what point does the expected benefit from saved property loss become uh, negligible compared to the actual right. cost of finding them? Right. Um, the, I, let me answer this in several ways, and I'll say the first answer is that, well, since a byproduct of this would be to find all the objects for space resources, uh, you know, your question may not <laughs> converge. You're a uh, good man, Dave. Right. <laughs> Uh, but I think that, that there is a legitimate issue here, and there have been some very interesting discussions of what the total risk to property is as a function of the size of the objects, for instance. Uh, and there's some economists that have looked at it and concluded, for instance, that it's reasonable to spend a few hundred million dollars a year on this in terms of the expected benefit. Um, but I can't do those calculations, and in the end, I don't think they are what motivate more people. It's more like what Congressman Dan Rohrabacher said in a talk three years ago when he simply stood up and said, if an asteroid can come out of space without warning and hit in my district and kill millions of people, that is unacceptable. No cost-benefit analysis, no probabilities, just that is unacceptable. I request a follow-up question, and since I have the microphone, I think I'll get away. Um, let's suppose we had a complete catalog of all of them, and we could predict everything and everything, mm -hmm. okay? Then we have comets. We have right. long-period comets. Right. There is a potentially much greater long-term threat than all the near-Earth asteroids put together, you know? Now, comets Chiron, are, Dave, I, I, comets are probably only about 1% of the threat. Chiron. The numerical that could, integrations des of that Chiron. could destroy life on Earth. Yes. Whereas, if you want to say that. Whereas, whereas nothing, you, look, say we have a species lifetime of 5 million years on average. A typical 5 million year impactor could wreck human civilization without threatening the species at all. Mm -hmm. Okay? But something like Chiron, there, you suddenly get into the, getting into something that is a real threat to, to the existence of humanity, right. to the biosphere. Well, Comet hale bopp How many of you saw hale bopp when it was here? Gorgeous comet. That was estimated at 40 kilometers across. That means it's an order of magnitude more energy than, the, more than a, at least an order of magnitude more energy than the KT. And, uh, and that came past the Earth. Uh, so, yes, if you want to move to comets, we have a whole new discussion because technically we don't know how to deal with them. But, but people are very risk averse, and if, if they get obsessive about the NEO threat, then they're ignoring something which is really a much, mm -hmm. you know, an unsolvable yeah. problem. When we have gone through, th there are people that have gone through this, and you know, there's a certain risk associated with the ones bigger than a kilometer. Even though we found 75% of them, even when we found 95% of them, the residual 5% still dominates the risk. And then you look at the risk down below, and you can, the NASA phrases, retire that risk. And pretty soon you get to the point where comets now are bigger than the sum of the undiscovered asteroids. And you can go through these calculations, but, but I don't think the way decisions are going to be made. And complete risk intolerance will bankrupt you every time. That's right. A million dollars for a thousand dollar life insurance policy. That's right. That's right. But we all know that these public policy decisions are not based on cost effectiveness uh, calculations. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could describe what, if any, current protocols exist at a national or international level for the detection of a, something that's a threat. I, I actually don't know. And then linked with that is, has there been any development in such protocols over the last, say, 20 years? Have we made any progress or no? Um, I can, the quickest shorthand answer to your statement is to say, this is being done by scientists. Uh, international scientists talk to each other. They do it openly. They publish all the results. 
day on the internet for anyone in the world to see. And our obligation as scientists, we feel, is that if we found anything, we would tell everyone immediately. Uh, I am always bemused by those who say, well, if, if you knew a big one was coming, would you tell anyone? Of course we would. And then that's where it stops, because there's no part of even our government, like Homeland Defense, that is figuring out what to do with that information. They're unaware of it. And that's certainly true on the international scale as well. But if we find it, It'll be in the papers the next day. Okay, uh, one more question, Penny. So I wanted to probe a little bit more into your own personal ethos on this. So cast your mind forward to a time when we have a solar system-wide civilization and we've exported Earth life to other places. So the world becomes somewhat less the entire repository of our uh, posterity. Mm -hmm. Would you have any different attitude in terms of which objects you would choose to deflect if all of Earth life and all of our species no longer simply resided on the home planet? Um, I can't answer a hypothetical question like that. Uh, <laughs> because think of all the other things. If we were only spacefaring civilization, if there were humans on the other planets, deflecting an asteroid would be so trivial, the incremental cost would be almost nothing. But should we do it, is the question. Oh, on the fundamental should issue, yes. should, should we, we interfere, interfere should we with interfere this natural process? With evolution? Uh, and would we be less likely to if we had our eggs in other baskets? Um, I believe that we would always want to protect the Earth, uh, and I think that as we ourselves are now a natural part of the evolutionary system and for the evolutionary system to defend itself is reasonable. But I certainly recognize that the alternative approach exists. Okay. What do you think, Benny? Um, I think that personally I would be more squeamish about constantly interfering with the natural process of evolution given the fact that our star has another five billion years, mm -hmm. of which our planet has another at least multiple billion years, and by effectively stopping evolutionary drivers like impactors, we are essentially robbing future biology, and that gives me pause. But aren't we affecting the planet already in much more profound ways? Possibly. Um, there, there are two great drivers of speciation these is catastrophes, and the other is geographical isolation. Now take the word geo out of there. <laughs> um, if we do indeed have a true spacefaring civilization, which is widely distributed around the solar system, then you have opportunities for speciation that arise quite naturally out of the isolations of the different gene pools. So, um, unless, you, unless you have such efficient uh, transportation that you, you do not seriously interfere with gene flow. I, I agree with that. and. I, Knowing my ancestors and their history, if any of my descendants are involved in this, you won't be able to find them. 